it, making sure this works. I went for this option because I can't get away from it. Hopefully you can hear me a little better. So I'm getting wrangled by this cord. Okay. Happy Sabbath. So for some of you who think that you have to get back to the scripture reading, I probably won't get to it. Middle of the week, I'm trying to find a verse that is concise to the thing I'm thinking about. I find that. It's short. It's concise. I pick that one. I don't put it in my sermon. So we'll never get there. If that's a problem for you, sorry. But uh, you want the long version, you can read... uh, the longer version, you can read Romans 8. If you want the really long region, version, read the whole book. The whole book. This week, as in fact, probably not this week, this month, as I have been considering what I wanted to talk about, the sense of inadequacy kept growing. And I don't say that to sound humble. I say that because the thing I'm trying to describe, we don't have words for So, it was difficult at best to try to pick what parts of this to talk about. Can't cover everything, but we can do our best, right? I've heard it described before, specifically talking about God, as it's a very large diamond. And if you look at it from this way, you get a certain color, and you come a little lower in a different color. When I picked out Sarah's diamond, uh, the guy showing it to me, though it was meager and small, he's like, come over here. And he takes a couple, and he puts the one I chose under a black light, and the color that came out of it was far different from all the rest. So I was pretty excited that that's the one I picked. And uh, at one point, she'd actually lost that, and we thought it was gone forever. And then I was cleaning out the back, of our, I think the Nissan or the Jeep at the time, and I find this little shiny thing over in the corner, and I pick it up, and there it is. It had fallen out of her ring, and so we still have it, but it's now in a plastic bag somewhere, probably. (laughs) But anyway, as we try to see this, we can see it for so many different angles. So the story today is probably just one way of telling the story. But I pray that it'll move your heart as it's moved mine. It's about the cross, and we hear that so often. And we can become blasé. Jesus died for you. Let's say amen and go home, right? But I was talking to Micah last weekend when we were up at Sarah's mom's house and trying to describe to him that God's so much more than that, and that we should always continue to try to see him in a more beautiful way, and talk about him in the most beautiful language that we can put on him. Um, If you are part of the Arise program, and you would like to maybe consider some of the stuff that just came across my plate as I was considering these things... um, One of the weekend intensives, The Messiah Dies, would be a place to go. Um, If you're working on the other part of the program, you could go move over to the sanctuary section and look at that. Just a place for you to go. Um, So if you want to pray with me this morning, we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful service that... Through you, each of us has provided this far. And Lord, we just pray that you will open all of our hearts and all of our minds to the thing that we are going to experience today, that it'll change us. It'll make us more appreciate you and what you went through for us. Lord, I pray that you will give me the language to communicate that in a way that glorifies you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So in uh, Sabbath school, we've gone through the book of Genesis. And we don't have a lot of language about what that was like there in the garden. Adam and Eve, God, face to face. This is uh, easier if you participate. So I'm going to ask, what kind of, what kind of things, what words can you place to that experience? Adam and Eve together in the garden. God walking there, the cool of the day, right? That's it. that's the sh- that's the picture we're told. What what emotions? What words do you place to that? Tranquility, okay. Beauty, friendship. What'd you just say? Exploring. I thought you said boring. <laughs> ah. hmm. Okay. New. It's new. Very true. Some of the words I put to it was peace, harmony, satisfaction, trust, love, unmeasurable, joy, peace, kindness, assurance, bliss. We get just tastes of that in our relationships and our experience here in this world. Just tastes of it. And I don't know if there's enough time to suffice to give you the time to, to really grasp what it would have been like in that moment, in that period of time that we don't know how long. But then the fall. What words come to your mind then? There in the garden, Adam and Eve, God, what words? Fear. Shame. Isolation. I wrote down fear, distrust, uncertainty, blame. And as the story goes on, you get anger and hate and murder. You see the weight. How far apart those two things are. And we live in a world that is mired in sin. It's to the point where we can't even really imagine, like, what it was before. A face-to-face communion with God. A trust for each other that (laughs) we only get tastes of. I could give you statistics and, I don't know, all kinds of gory pictures and all that to to describe this world that we live in, the the atrocities and the, but you just really just got to turn on the news. And maybe not even that, maybe in your own life you've experienced these things. So we already know how awful it is. And sometimes people use these awful experiences in this world to, to discredit God and, and, and say he's not real. But that feeling that you have by witnessing, experiencing these events, that's just a taste of the way God feels, I would argue. I'm going to read you a quotation. It comes from Education, page 26, or 263, excuse me. Book, it, book written by Ellen White. As the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together, this comes from Romans 8, 26, 22, the heart of the infinite Father is pained in sympathy. A world is a vast laser house, a scene of misery. Old English term, laser house. We have no clue what she's talking about, right? So I looked it up. It comes from a description of a leper colony, a lazarette, a leprosium. A laser house was historically a place of isolated people with leprosy. It comes from a biblical figure, St. Lazarus. And uh, so that kind of helps you understand 
This is our whole world. Our world is a vast laser house, a scene of misery that we dare not allow even our, thought, our thoughts to dwell upon. Did we realize it as it is, the burden would be too terrible. Yet God feels it all. In order to destroy sin and the results, he gave his best beloved. See, God's out there, but he feels what's going on here. He feels what's going on in your life. The atrocities that you face, the, the burdens, the, the pain. See, God's in a predicament. The thing that God hates most resides within the thing he loves most. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Sin, the thing he hates so much, resides inside of us. And he, and he doesn't just hate it just because he hates it, but it's the thing that separates us from him. We feel this in our own relationships. If we wrong somebody, it's hard for us to be around them. We want to stay away until we're certain that they've forgiven us, that we might be able to begin to have communion with them. And, and if it's really bad in this world, we may never have to have that eye-to-eye -eye contact again. We just, it isn't going to feel right. We can feel the same way with God. We do something. We want to go hide from him, just as Adam and Eve. And uh, somehow think that we can fix ourselves up and, and then we'll get back to him. Hopefully I can, I can change your mind about that. See, God desires that we would have face-to-face -face communion with him. In fact, he... He wants it so badly that he's promised in his word that one day we would have it again. But that sin of ours makes that difficult. Exodus 33, 20 says, speaking with Moses, Moses there in the desert wanting to see God's face. You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. Isaiah, describing when he sees God, says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Daniel, a man of no record in the Bible of any ill that he'd ever done, even when those in his community are trying to catch him doing something, the only thing they can find is that he's not obeying the laws of the land and instead following the laws of his God. Daniel 10, 8, my, clum, my comeliness, his beauty, was turned into com corruption. See, I would like to think that even if I came in the presence of Daniel, I might feel a little uncomfortable. So how much more might I feel uncomfortable bearing all my sin in the presence of God? My sin, my guilt, my shame the misunderstandings I have about God, the lies I've believed from the, from the devil about God. <laughs> when we come into the presence of God, we see ourselves as we truly are because of his goodness, his beauty, his righteousness. See, we all, to a certain degree, 
see God veiled at this point. We see little bits of him, and he reveals to us the problems in our lives and invites us to come to him and change those things, to, to bear them slowly, to be transformed by his love. Revelation 22.4 promises, They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. So how do we get there? How do we get from the point where, man, I am undone to being in his presence? This is where the, the cross of Christ comes in. Now, the story of Jesus coming into this world is a big story. John says, in fact, we could continue, continue to fill the world with books written about this thing. So, it's large. But one of the most important points is to make is that God didn't stay separated from the pain and suffering of this world. He came into it. The incarnation of G God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. Him taking on humanity, taking on our bodies. Even in that, there's some sort of separation from the Father. He's not in that whatever that is that we don't have language to describe. He came in here and became one of us. And the separation that we in some way feel from God, even as close as sometimes we do feel, he had to take that on. So that's an, a new experience for him. So I'm going to go through as best I can in my own feeble mind the, the experiences Jesus had here on this earth. Jesus' life threatened as a baby, right? All these children under a certain age need to be destroyed. We're afraid of this, this Messiah, this new king. And so not only is, he, is his life threatened, but now he has to become a refugee in Egypt because of it. At some point, as a young man, he loses his earthly father. When he starts his ministry, some of his family, some of his closest friends, the people in his, his city reject him. The religious leaders constantly seeking to destroy him. The pain and suffering all around him that he longs to bring to an end. He felt it all. In his life, he experienced the best and the worst of humanity. In the midst of coming to terms with the, that, the, that the end of his life was nearing, one friend sells him out and the others disappoint him. He's arrested falsely. His trial is a sham. He's sentenced to death. Barnabas is pardoned in his place. These are some of the tragedies I'm sure he faced. But um, in the garden... And on the cross, he suffered probably one of the greater tragedies. Now, the story of the Garden of Gethsemane is, I guess if, you, if I don't tell it good enough, you can visit there in, in, in scriptures, or you can go and, and read Ellen White's account of it. I'll do my best. After the Last Supper, they went into the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed. They came to the Garden of Gethsemane, to his place. He left his disciples, asking them to pray for him, for at this point, he was feeling sorrowful and deeply distressed. Taking Peter, James, and John deeper in, he asked them to pray, saying, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. As he prayed, he asked his father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. 
He rose, went to the disciples, found them sleeping, asking him that they might pray with him again. He returned to prayer with the Father. The ever, the agony ever increasing. Asking the Father again to remove this cup from him. And once again, following with it, not my will, but yours be done. Returning again to the disciples, looking for encouragement and strength, and again finding them sleeping. The agony of the moment weighing on him, he again fell to the cold ground, clenching it, as if not to be pulled farther from the Father. And an angel appeared to him, strengthening him. What might this angel have said? Remember the voice? You are my son and who I'm well pleased. Remember the miracles done through you. The transfiguration. Whatever this angel has said, we don't know. But he somehow, in those moments, strengthens Jesus. Now strengthened, he more earnestly prays. His sweat turning into great drops of blood, asking again that this cup might pass from him. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. There, in that nevertheless, hangs you and I. What's happening here? There's no scourging. There's no crown of thorns. There's no nails in his hands. Jesus is so closely identifies with us that our sin becomes his. As we previously learned, our sin separates us from God. Jesus is beginning to feel the separation from the Father that he previously had never known. He's taking on himself our griefs, our sorrows. The ones the people have placed on us by the things they've done to us. He's taking on our guilt, our shame, our sin that separates us from God. Isaiah 53 describes these things. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now if you read the Gospel of John, he leaves the whole garden story out. But what he does give you is a story is a prayer that Jesus gives near the end of his life. And maybe those are those prayers in between there that we don't know anything about in the rest of the Gospels. But what this prayer does detail is that Jesus and his desire that we would have the experience he was having in this world. He, he describes the relationship he has with humanity and the relationship he has to the Father. And Jesus' desire that we might have the same relationship with the Father as he has had, and that we might have the same relationship with others that Jesus has had. You can, you can read that through verses 16 and 17. See, the very thing that Jesus so badly wanted us to have is the very thing he gave up so that we can. The thing so amazing that we can't even put words to, he was willing to give up for you and me. Later, on the cross, Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus faces the full separation of our sin. The sin that will, we eventually will have to bear. But he bears it so that we don't have to. At some point, I don't know where my crazy head was. I thought that I could do that. You, you're God. You can see beyond this thing happening. It, it, it's not that hard. How wrong I was. But he doesn't just do this with a crowd of onlooking people that love him. No. 
He chooses humanity. He chooses you and me with only a handful of people looking on to him. His mother, his mother's sister, Mary Magdalene and John standing there. The rest of the crowd stirred with anger and hatred, desiring him dead. And yet comes the voice. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrated his love. Excuse me. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Desire of Ages, page 753, tells us, The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present him coming out from the grave as a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that the sin was so offensive to God that separation would be eternal. The only thing he had to cling to was the promises that he had learned in Scripture and the experiences that he had with God that he might rise on the other side. But because of the separation that I should feel from, thought, like, from God, that he took upon himself, he could not see that. God literally loves you and me more than his own eternal existence. The Signs of the Times, May 30, 1895, states, The atonement of Christ was not made in order to induce God to love those whom he otherwise hated. It was not made to produce a love that was not in existence, but was made as a manifestation of the love that was already in God's heart. An exponent of his divine favor in the sight of a heavenly intelligence, in the sight of the world's unfallen, and in the sight of fallen man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We are not to entertain the idea that God loves us because Christ has died for us, but that he so loved us that he gave his only begotten Son to die for us. I now realize that I had missed part of the uh, quote from education. So I guess we're doing it now. Maybe this is when it should be said. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony. That suffering did not begin or end with his manifestation in humanity. Prior to all of this happening here, he already felt the pain that this would bring, and yet he still goes through with it. Quote continues, The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that is from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God. Our dull senses. I was struck by that. How... how 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 we really just don't understand the mire that we are in. And the thing that God so badly wants us to have and we so flippantly take it sometimes. Every departure from the right, every deed of cruelty, every failure of humanity to reach his ideal brings grief to him. When there came upon Israel the calamities that were sure result to separate them from God, sub subjugation by their enemies, cruelty and death, it is said that his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel and all their affliction he was afflicted. God, Jesus didn't come into this world 
to do something that made God happy to love us. He came into this world to show how much he did love us. He was God. He was in the beginning with God. He was God. And Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And the Father himself loves you. The title was, Trust Me, It's So Much Better. Jesus is trying to communicate to us that the thing he had, the only thing that really matters is that relationship with God and a correct relationship with humanity. It's so much better. I remember as my kids grew up trying to get them to try new foods. And it was hard. Man, Micah got into this place where he just wanted to eat a few certain things, and those things were not great. <laughs> He's better now. But the thing that really struck me, especially I think it was more Claire, dessert. Trying to convince them that this dessert that looks kind of messed up is really good. Really good. We find ourselves in a mess. But the thing that's out there, God wants for us so badly, is so much better. We sometimes like to point out sins, and that's part of the story. But the greater part of the story is that there's something so much better than these sins that we're not so willing to give up. I guess we don't have closing songs anymore, so if you'll pray with me as we go this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us. Though to our dull hearts, we can barely see it. And we thank you that you don't come to us all in one big flash. That that one might pain us. But you come to us softly, veiled, so that we can be transformed, changed, made new in you. Lord, change our hearts, change our minds about you so that we can come boldly to the throne of grace in our time of need where we can find healing and help. Help us to find that relationship with you that will transform us, that will change us so that in this world we can have relationships with other people that are more like Jesus. Lord, we all are broken. We've all experienced terrible things. And it changes us and makes us hard. We ask that you will soften us. Make us more like you. May we see people in their chains and like you come into their world. Help them, guide them through us, we pray in Jesus' name.